right, looks like we are live and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie and I am your host for tonight's program on historical versus operational science. It is a privilege to have Paul Price here with me for an important presentation on this topic. This event also includes a post-presentation open mic discussion. And so if you have questions, you have objections, challenges, criticisms, whatever they may be, make sure to stick around for the discussion portion of this event. Paul, as always, it's a pleasure to have you. You're definitely not a stranger to uh, this channel and these topics. You are and have put out excellent articles that I have uh, heavily benefited from. You've done several formal debates here, going back even between two and three years ago, brother, with your uh, genetic entropy formal yeah. debate with Dr. Ron Garrett. Excellent debate. And so for people who want to see more from you, I do have uh, the relevant links posted in the description box. So Paul, let me hand it over to you before the presentation, just for a brief introduction into, into who you are for anybody who might be unfamiliar with you. Absolutely. And I've got my uh, dinosaur tie on tonight at trying to pay homage to all the old 1980s and 90s, uh, you know, creation speakers that always had to wear a, uh, a dinosaur tie. So I thought right. I'd get in on that. Although I think these dinosaurs are too small to really to really even make out. But it's the thought that counts anyway. So we're going to put the challenge out there. If people can guess which dinosaurs exactly are reflected on your tie. I'm going to guess a bird because people are saying birds are dinosaurs. OK, right? so. there you go. <laughs> just kidding. Of course, I was going to guess that it's a hadrosaur, but uh, that's just because I'm going to mention a hadrosaur in my talk tonight. Awesome. Well, so this talk is is an important one. I'm excited for it. I know many in the audience are as well. And so just to, I guess, go over the format that we have for tonight, Paul, you are going to be giving a presentation, comprehensive presentation on the topic. And then I am going to probably about 15 minutes or so before the presentation is over to the audience. I will, as always, with the open mic portions of these events, I'll post the StreamYard link for people to join. We will be uh, bringing in one person at a time to engage Paul, and that way we'll keep it structured and uh, avoid any, any chaos. And so uh, for anybody in the audience who does want to join that portion, make sure to stick around, watch Paul's presentation, and if any uh, questions come to mind, you can join and ask Paul directly yourself. So, Paul, sounds like you're doing well today. You look good, brother. Thank you. And if there's anything else you'd like to add, I guess we'll uh, get into the presentation. Yeah, uh, I'm excited to get started. As always, my opinions are my own. But, uh, you know, I have I you know, my background on this is that I came uh, from a I used to be uh, employed full time in apologetics for creation ministries, creation.com. And that's where most of my written articles are published at. I do have one article over at Answers in Genesis so far, but um, for the most part, creation.com. And, uh, you know, the talk that I'm going to give tonight, if if any of our audience has ever seen uh, a standard um, what we call relevance talk or the, the kind of introductory entry level creation presentation, then you will have at least heard a little bit about historical science versus operational science. Uh, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth tonight, and that's going to be my main focus as opposed to it just being, you know, one or two slides of a of an overall presentation. But, uh, you know, I think it was my debate with Mark Reed that sort of inspired me to want to give this talk. Uh, you know, he he keeps mentioning, and but he, he's certainly just representative, really, of the overall type of things that you hear from the atheist community. Um, you know, I believe he kept saying that he wanted to see some type of repeatable scientific evidence for the existence of God. And that's something that I, I can't quite figure out what he expects or, or what he means by that. But uh, in just a moment here, I'm going to explain why that sort of a demand doesn't really make a lot of sense in light of, uh, you know, what what science is and, and how we need to understand it. So I'm going to share my screen. And let's see here. I'm going to go right in 
And uh, Donnie, is this looking good? We yes, it does. It's up on the screen. All right. Malcolm perfect. Effect, we're good to go. So this is called the Malcolm Effect, historical science, operational science, and the sliding scale of trust. And uh, if any of you are fans of Jurassic Park, uh, and I mean uh, a big enough fan that you've actually read the book, Jurassic Park, then you might know uh, where I'm going with the Malcolm effect, but we'll see. Uh, so this is a little hypothetical argument uh, I came up with um, to try to uh, ease us into this topic of defining science and to try to help us understand why in the world of creation and evolution and apologetics, uh, why is this so, so important that we get it right? Unfortunately, I've seen so many debates, so many arguments between believers and unbelievers, and, and so often this, this linchpin uh, piece of information just gets left on the table, never discussed, never understood, and it's a real shame, so I'm hoping to help with that. I'm hoping that everybody's going to pay close attention to what I have to say tonight when it comes to this, so... Put your smartphones away, put your uh, Game Boys back in your book bag, and uh, pay attention to this uh, lecture here. <laughs> but uh, here's, a, here's a hypothetical argument. Trees are vital to the initial planning stages of a new project with multiple potential chains of action depending upon prevailing conditions at the time of execution. And then, no, that's not what trees are at all. Uh, trees are plants that have a trunk and branches and leaves. So here you have uh, somebody arguing about something who, who doesn't even understand they're talking about two different things. If you add the clarification here or the uh, disambiguation, if you will, uh, the first one there is decision trees are vital to the initial planning stages of a project, whereas biological trees are plants. And what is the relevance to that? Well, let's look at how the word science is used. And I want you guys to read these sentences, or I'll read them to you. And you uh, let me know if you think that, the, that we're actually talking about the same thing in all of these cases. Science has shown that the earth is millions of years old. Science has shown there is no God. Science shows us that dead men do not rise from the grave. Science demonstrated through fingerprint analysis that the suspect was present at the scene of the crime. And science tells us that the force of gravity accelerates objects toward the earth at 9.8 meters per second per second. So are all of these words science uh, referring to the same exact thing here? I would argue that they're not. And that is very important because uh, as all of you are aware, science is kind of the uh, the religion of our age and our and our time and our uh, our civilization if you will science is uh, scientists are kind of viewed at, almost as the priests of our day but what actually is science how can we define it so I've attempted to take us to what everybody on both sides might agree is at least a mostly unbiased source the Encyclopedia Britannica science according to Britannica, is any system of knowledge that is concerned with the physical world and its phenomena and that entails unbiased observations, and take note that I've bolded some important phrases here, unbiased observations and systematic experimentation. In general, a science involves a pursuit of knowledge covering general truths or the operations of fundamental laws. Now, notice the word operations there because uh, this definition, even though Britannica is just giving it for science in general, really this is a definition of operational science. Operational science means uh, we are talking about general truths about nature, how uh, the ongoing laws of nature operate. So that's why it's called operational science. And I'm sure all of you have also seen this little diagram right here as well. This is the scientific method. And I've put a star down there at the bottom, um, test with experiment. And that is a really, really key, important distinction here for operational science. So operational science is defined perhaps more than any other thing by the fact that we can do tests that are repeatable. And repeatability 
uh, is sort of implied by the fact that we have this circle here with the arrow going back to the beginning from the end. So we're supposedly able to repeat these tests over and over uh, to continue to show uh, the result that uh, hopefully will confirm our hypothesis or really more accurately fail to disconfirm. Because what we're trying to do in science is that we're trying to identify a, an experimental result that would absolutely not be compatible with our hypothesis. And if we can identify that possible result, and then if we obtain that result, then what we say is that we have falsified our hypothesis. And that's a very important thing that we can do in operational science is that we have falsifiable hypotheses. Uh, now, the type of reasoning that we're doing here in this scientific method is inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is simply where you're reasoning from the part to the whole, or you're reasoning from individual pieces of data to try to form generalizations about how the world works. And it's also important to note, and I've, I've mentioned this in, a, in one of my previous debates, the only reason we can do inductive reasoning is because we're assuming something called the uniformity of nature. Now, the uniformity of nature just simply means the future is going to be like the past. Things are going to continue to be as we've observed them to be before. And we can't prove that using science because science depends upon assuming that. As creationists, as Christians, we believe in God, and we actually have a grounding for this belief in uniformity from the nature of God who upholds his creation. And he's not capricious. He's not a lying demon. So uh, we have uh, reason to believe in the uniformity of nature. Uh, atheistic scientists, on the other hand, just simply have to take this as a brute fact with no further explanation possible. They just have no basis for it, but they just have to assume it. Now, let's compare that to history, or what we can call historical science. Now, that differs from operational science because it lacks two of the key features that make up the definition of operational science. Historical events are not repeatable, and historical events are not falsifiable. Now, in historical science, we're doing something called abductive reasoning, which is where we're looking at an overall um, presentation of clues or evidence, and we're trying to infer the best explanation for that available evidence. And that's called abductive reasoning. It's inference to the best explanation. That's different from inductive reasoning. Uh, now, regarding the falsification aspect, again, the reason that this is so important is to understand that in historical science, we lack that ability of falsification. No matter what the finding is from the field, even if it's unexpected, uh, we can never conclusively prove that a past historical event did not happen. And so for this reason, we say that history cannot be falsified. And if something cannot be falsified, the question would come up, does it really deserve to be called science? Let's say that you're a crime scene detective and you don't find any fingerprints uh, of the suspect at the crime scene. Does that falsify the crime? No. The suspect could have worn gloves. What if you fail to find a murder weapon? Does that falsify anything? No, because the murder weapon could have been disposed of. What about no body? Also could have been disposed of. Uh, when we do uh, historical science, we also call this forensic science, especially in a court of law type of context. We call it forensic science. But you can't falsify things because even if you don't find the evidence, you have not proved uh, something did not occur. Absence of evidence, as they say, is not uh, evidence of absence. Uh, now, this is a quote from Dr. Henry G., who's a British paleontologist and evolutionary biologist. And he said, historical hypotheses can never be tested by experiment, and so they are unscientific. No science can ever be historical. Now, it is ironic that he said this. I'm not sure if he would fully understand the implications as it regards to evolutionary biology itself, uh, the fact that he's saying that historical uh, claims are, are not science. But the, the place that I got this quote from is actually the writings of Dr. Carol Cleland, uh, whom we're about to meet here. She is a well-known uh, evolutionary philosopher of science. 
And she is actually going to disagree with Dr. G. Her goal is to try to rescue historical science from these types of attacks uh, that are being made by people like Dr. G or even myself in the creationist community. Uh, and for whatever reason, she calls it historiographic science. Maybe that just sounds a little bit fancier, but she says historiographic science differs in important ways from experimental science. The hypotheses of experimental science typically postulate regularities among kinds or types of events. In contrast, the hypotheses of scientific historiography typically postulate particular events. Now, one of the reasons that this is such an important quote is that it demonstrates beyond any question uh, that the, the atheistic attack that you will normally hear when you bring up this concept of historical science, they'll say, well, that's just a made-up idea that creationists have made up for purely self-serving reasons. Real scientists don't talk about historical science versus operational science. Well, actually, if you get into the actual philosophy of science, which unfortunately most scientists do not, uh, you'll find that uh, people like Dr. Cleland uh, very clearly do use this distinction, and they mean the same thing by it that we mean in the creationist community when we say historical science. Now, she argues, uh, contrary to what I'm presenting, she argues that they are equal in terms of re reliability. Uh, but ironically, she doesn't do this by trying to strengthen the case for historical science, but rather she tries to attack the objectivity of empirical or operational science and tries to knock it down a couple pegs to where she feels it'll be on par with uh, historical science. She argues that scientists in, in historical science do tests in the realm of history by searching for so-called smoking gun evidence in the field. This supposedly overcomes the problem of historical science lacking objectivity. But the problem is, for any given set of available clues, there is an infinite number of conceivable ways to explain how those clues came to be. And we call that underdetermination. We would say, uh, the technical term there is that the evidence underdetermines uh, the theory. So uh, this means that inevitably personal biases will come into play when constructing stories about the evidence. Now, Cleland wrote in 2001, um, a smoking gun is a trace that picks out one of the competing hypotheses as providing a better causal explanation for the currently available traces than the others. Now, I want you to uh, home in here on these important underlined words and phrases because I think they show uh, just how much room there is for subjectivity here. Who decides what is a better explanation? And what about the currently available? Who decides if um, you know the amount of evidence that we have available is sufficient to give us a clear picture of the past? Who decides that? And who decides what evidence doesn't get, uh, you know, uh, brought into brought into play? Uh, now, ten years later, Dr. Cleland wrote a little bit more soberly on this. I'm not sure if she had any type of change of views or if she was just being a little bit more uh, transparent here. But she said, even supposing that the correct explanation is among those under consideration. There are no guarantees that a smoking gun for it will be found, even supposing that one exists. And so, Dr. Cleland, I'm sorry, but that doesn't sound very optimistic. That sounds rather pessimistic. It sounds like we can't have very much confidence in historical science. But she's actually leaving out the biggest problem of all. Even if a smoking gun is found, there is no guarantee it will be accepted as such or interpreted correctly. I'm going to give you a really important case in point on this. Unpermineralized or unfossilized dinosaur bones and soft tissue finds are smoking gun evidence that dinos are not millions of years old. I wrote on this at creation.com several years back, and I would encourage you to check that article out, as well as a follow-up article uh, that I wrote to it. But uh, I also wrote in the Journal of Creation, I did a little bit of research on the uh, survival of bone as a material. And a very conservative upper estimate 
for uh, the survival of actual bone material would be 700,000 years at 10 degrees Celsius. Now, that's very conservative, but Dr. Brian Thomas of the Institute of Creation Research uh, recently, for his doctoral dissertation, did actual operational science. He did some original research on these various biomolecules, and he calculated that bone collagen has a half-life of 1,678 years at 7.5 degrees Celsius, and that would definitely imply a real upper limit of under 10,000 years for any surviving bone material. Yet, the Liscombe bone bed from which the unpermineralized hadrosaur bones were taken has been dated radiometrically to approximately 70 million years old. It can't be. Bones cannot last nearly that long. They are blatantly cherry-picking the data and ignoring contrary evidence. Now, I argue that we should approach historical science as a sliding scale of trust, with claims made about recent events being more trustworthy than claims made about events in the remote past. And this is why we can consider forensic studies and crime scenes, for example, uh, to be legitimate historical science while rejecting the lofty claims to knowledge made by scientists talking about events supposedly happening millions of years ago. So I argue that historical science is generally less trustworthy than operational science for three main reasons. One, Reconstructions of past events are limited by our experience, our imagination, and our personal biases. Two, evidence is lost over time. And three, my favorite, uh, we're going to get to that one last, chaos theory. So on this topic of using your imagination and how personal biases and those types of things can come in, I, I've brought up a, a photo here of a skull. Now, this is not an extinct animal, but I'd like you to pretend for just a moment that you're looking at the skull of an extinct animal that someone has found. No one has ever seen this animal before. And how would you try to interpret this skull? What sorts of assumptions might you make about this animal from looking at the skull? And I know speaking for me, I mean, you can't really see uh, without context exactly how big or small this skull uh, is. But I will say that it, it, it has a certain almost canine look about it. it. You can definitely see in the front of the skull there some long, sharp teeth that would be good for ripping flesh. And as, as the teeth move back in the mouth, uh, they start to flatten out a bit. And so I might guess it might be either a carnivore or an omnivore. But what I prob probably would not guess is what it actually is, which is this. So what you're looking at here is a fruit bat, and that is the skull of a fruit bat. And the reason I bring this up is just to show that things are not always as they seem at first appearance. And because we're talking about something in the remote past that cannot be repeated, cannot be witnessed, there's really no way uh, for us to know just how far off our guesses are when we're talking about evidence and pieces of evidence that come from the remote past. One study concluded uh, that cold cases are solved using physical evidence only about 13% of the time. Eyewitness testimony, on the other hand, resulted in a closed case 63% of the time. Now, why do you think that might be? This is moving on to point number two, evidence lost. The reason that cold cases are generally not solved using physical evidence is that evidence is lost over time. If you didn't have enough evidence to convict early on, it's very unlikely uh, that you're suddenly going to have evidence to convict decades later, uh, whereas eyewitness testimony may come out of the woodwork, and more often than not, that is how cold cases are solved. Um, here's another example here. Arches National Park has over 2,000 rock arches, and that's actually what I have as my background for this presentation. Uh, 43 of them collapsed between 1977 and 2015, according to park rangers. And that gives us a rate of collapse of about one per year, allowing that vandals might have destroyed a small number. 
Such an attrition rate would mean that all of them would be gone in about 2,000 years at the prevailing rates of erosion from wind and rain. This is from uh, Dr. Don Batten's article, Age of Arches at creation.com. And this is a really like a double whammy piece of evidence because not only does this show us that these rock arches are not forming today, because how could they? If they're supposedly millions of years old, but we're losing one per year, we're going to have them all gone in only 2,000 years. So clearly, uh, they are not stable enough to last millions of years, let alone form over millions of years. Uh, however, uh, it's also showing us just how much evidence we're losing all the time. What other geological features that point to Noah's flood have already been lost, obscuring our picture of the past. I mean, I when I look at geology, to me, it's really obvious that there was a global flood. But imagine how much more obvious it would have been a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three thousand years ago, uh, when so much of the evidence had not yet eroded away and been lost. The further away you get from an event, the fewer physical clues we will have. So that's an important thing to chew on. Let's move on to uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm's favorite topic, chaos theory. Now, Ian Malcolm, uh, as you may or may not be aware, is portrayed by uh, perhaps the most amazing man ever to live, uh, Jeff Goldblum. And here's, now this is actually fractalfoundation.org. I went and got their definition of chaos theory. And it really boils down to unpredictability because we can never know all the initial conditions of a complex system in sufficient detail, we cannot hope to predict the ultimate fate of a complex system. Even slight errors in measuring the state of a system will be amplified dramatically, rendering any prediction useless. Since it is impossible to measure the effects of all the butterflies, for example, in the world, uh, accurate long-range weather prediction will always remain impossible. Now, here is a quote straight from Ian Malcolm himself from the book, not the movie, Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. Chaos theory says two things. First, that complex systems like weather have an underlying order. Second, the reverse of that, that simple systems can produce complex behavior. For example, pool balls. You hit a pool ball, and it starts to carom off the sides of the table. In theory, that's a fairly simple system, almost a Newtonian system. Since you can know the force imparted to the ball and the mass of the ball, and you can calculate the angles at which it will strike the walls, you can predict the future behavior of the ball. In theory, you could predict the behavior of the ball far into the future as it keeps bouncing from side to side. You could predict where it will end up three hours from now in theory. But in fact, it turns out you can't predict more than a few seconds into the future because almost immediately very small effects, imperfections in the surface of the ball, tiny indentations in the wood of the table start to make a difference. And it doesn't take long before they overpower your careful calculations. So it turns out that the simple system of a pool ball on a table has unpredictable behavior. Now, in case you think that Michael Crichton was just making this up for his fiction book, uh, in 1978, a physicist, Michael Berry, calculated the number of collisions a billiard ball can make before a player has no way of knowing its eventual trajectory. It turned out that such calculations required taking into account not just mechanical forces, but the gravity of the Earth and the gravitational pull of objects close to the table. Berry estimated that that if that object, for instance, is a person who weighs 50 kilos, the determinacy would be lost after nine collisions, or even before, if not considering the gravity impact. So if using physics to predict the future gets exponentially harder as you move further away from the present moment, the same is true in reverse. The same is true of the past. This fact dooms all attempts to use so-called dating methods over alleged deep time. We cannot even predict the motion of billiard balls past a handful of collisions. How are we possibly going to accurately interpret the results of radioactive decay and rocks spanning over millions of years of unknown history? Can anybody say hubris? 
The moral of the story of Jurassic Park is simply this. People overestimate how much control they have over nature, and this is partly because they overestimate their level of understanding. In other words, we need to approach the world with a much greater sense of humility. What does humility in science look like? Well, one, I would say, not extrapolating far beyond your data. That's a good starting point. That's humility in science and in uh, data analytics, by the way. Uh, how about not cherry-picking your data? That would also be great. Uh, not using the word science in an unqualified and misleading way. Not making appeals to authority, fallacious or otherwise. That one really uh, irritates me sometimes. Well, people try to get cute and say, oh, an appeal to authority is not a fallacy because you're just saying, well, it's more likely that the expert is right than they're wrong. And if you want to say that, you, you know, technically it's not a deductive fallacy at that point, but it's a very, very weak inductive argument, and it doesn't uh, speak well to humility. Uh, let's just talk about the arguments and the evidence. Let's not make arguments based on people's credentials or based on saying, everybody agrees with me, therefore you're wrong. How about recognizing the practical limits of science? And lastly, recognizing there are other sources of truth besides science. Science is just a tool. So for more on this topic, uh, for further reading, I do suggest you check out both of these articles at creation.com. Uh, I wrote the top one and I co-wrote the bottom one with Dr. Robert Carter. Highly uh, good places to go do further reading on this. And as a final appendix to this conversation, I want to briefly touch on the overwhelming evidences favoring a young earth. And I'm going to also talk about the evidences for an old earth. And in both cases, I'm going to start with the most important thing. The most important thing on the list I put first. And the most important powerful evidence for a young earth is that simply the Bible teaches it. And you might think that's circular. It, it's not circular because the Bible has passed every test we can throw at it. It has uniquely shown itself to be the Word of God. Uh, it, it contains so many examples of miraculously fulfilled prophecy that for me, I'm not going to put my eternal destiny anywhere but squarely on the Bible and on uh, Jesus Christ. So the fact that the Bible teaches a young earth is enough for me. And it should be enough for anybody else. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, but it's certainly enough to be rational about saying that the earth is young. Simply, God was there and he told us. But let's move on from there and let's use some of this extrapolation that evolutionary scientists are so fond of. And it turns out that there are so many uh, ways that we can extrapolate different present day processes that actually don't support a young earth. I mean, a they actually don't support an old earth. And I already mentioned the first one there, soft tissue and unpermineralized bone found in supposedly ancient strata. Uh, what about quickly crumbling geological features like rock arches? What about ocean salinity accumulating too quickly? Ocean nickel concentrations insufficient for old ages. Insufficient seafloor, seafloor sediment for long ages. Too much uh, sediment is being dumped into the ocean. We don't find enough seafloor sediment for the earth to be millions and millions of years old. And lastly, uh, too much helium is being found in rocks, but not enough helium is found in the atmosphere. That's an interesting one that uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys, who was part of the Rate Project, uh, he's written on that. So I recommend these articles here for uh, looking further into these evidences um, that I've just listed there. But let's briefly go over what is supposedly the evidence. I find it rather underwhelming, favoring an old earth. And the most important reason for believing in an old earth is evolution requires it. Yes, absolutely. Evolution cannot hope to have a chance uh, on a young earth, and everybody knows it. So that's why uh, you know evolutionists are going to stick their heels so, so far into the dirt on this topic. They absolutely cannot give up an old earth because if they do, they've, they've lost the game entirely. Now, I would argue that for different reasons, they can't win either way. Even if you give them an old earth, they still can't win that argument. But they certainly do need an old earth. And so that is why back in 
the 1700s, you had a small group of evolutionists, and uh, I will mention they were actually Freemasons in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I've actually been to that Freemasonic Lodge in, in Edinburgh. I mean, I didn't get to go in, but I, I went and, and looked at the outside door where uh, the first old earthers and evolutionists uh, in modern history uh, kind of got together and talked about their ideas. But yeah, it, evolution requires it. And long before you had uh, modern so-called dating methods, they were already believing in an old earth. That's telling. Uh, and the reason wasn't because they had found, uh, you know, some type of dating method proof. It was because their philosophy of deism and evolutionism uh, absolutely demanded it. Um, now, the second thing on the list, everybody knows this one, but radiometric dating shows too much daughter isotope in rocks for a young Earth. Why do we find so much daughter isotope? And it is an open question. It's a very interesting question. And uh, scientists in the creation community have attempted to address this question in a number of very different ways. So it's, it's definitely an area of ongoing research and debate within the creation community. Um, but uh, one of the things that has been presented is some evidence for periods of possible accelerated radiometric decay in the past. We don't know that for a fact, but it's been proposed at least. And yes, it does entail a potential uh, follow-up issue or question. What about the heat that would, uh, you know, perhaps be produced by this? Uh, because when radiometric decay happens, it does release heat. So how would we have survived all of the ex excess heat that this would produce? And we don't know. That is an open question. Um, but I'm very interested to see the further research that hopefully will be getting done. It's hard to do research when you don't have funding. I will say that. Um, and lastly, distant starlight. How did the starlight get here? If what we think we know about light is accurate, uh, it seems like light travels in such a way that we couldn't be able to see uh, what we see in the cosmos uh, without the light traveling over these extensive distances. And just like the previous, this is something that has been tackled in various different ways, and it is still an open research question and, and debate topic among uh, creationists. But I will point out, uh, I want to, um, so on both of these two questions, I've got recommended research for further reading here. Uh, the top article there, Accelerated nuclear decay extinguishes extinct nucleotides argument from creation.com. However, talking about distant starlight, I want to recommend people check out the Veritasium video, Why No One Has Measured the Speed of Light. Now, this is an important one because this video was not made by a creationist organization or even a creationist at all. It's just a popular YouTube video that happens to back up what Dr. Jason Lyle has been pointing out recently about this issue, and it turns out that we cannot objectively measure the speed of light uh, going only one direction. All of our measurements of light speed uh, are two-way round-trip uh, measurements, and so all of this kind of depends upon an underlying assumption about the universe on a cosmic scale that light must travel the same speed in all directions throughout the universe. And it turns out uh, that that is just simply an assertion or an assumption that's being made, and it cannot be verified using science. So is it possible, perhaps, that light does not travel at the same speed in all directions throughout our universe? Who knows? It's an interesting research topic. It's an interesting question. But the point is, since we don't know for a fact what the one-way speed of light is in all directions throughout the universe, it kind of... Uh, throws some water on this whole argument of, uh, you know, well, distant starlight proves that the Earth must be old. Well, no, it doesn't. You're just assuming that, and you're assuming a cosmology that cannot be proven. So uh, with that, I think I am going to end my presentation tonight and open it up for an opportunity for a uh, question and answer session. <clears throat> Paul, very good, very detailed. I appreciate that. Uh, you answered 
most of my questions that I would have, one of them being uh, criticism that I've heard over and over again, as you address that basically this is something creationists make up this distinction between historical and operational science. And they will claim we essentially make this distinction up in order to avoid having to address all the number of lines of evidence for evolution. What's, what's a good quick response to that? Paul? Well, just take people to my article where I go into it in depth and show and, and I quote from uh, Dr. Carol Cleland, the evolutionary philosopher of science, who clearly uses the same distinction, historical. Or not. She doesn't say it in those words. She she calls it, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, she, she called it experimental science and historiographic science. But whatever words you want to use, the, the distinction means what it means. And everybody knows that that, that is what it is. It's just that uh, atheists like to try to, uh, you know, throw sand in your eyes and and confuse the argument and try to 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 gaslight you and ignore the the obvious so but yeah it it, it is well documented that, that that the concept of historical science is not something that creationists have made up great answer yeah, I, I appreciated your points on the fossil record because the fossil record can involve a lot of storytelling and um just a lot of, as you've pointed out, assumptions that are based mostly on historical science, things that we don't necessarily know or even match up to real world data. Can you speak to that a little bit, uh, Paul, before I start bringing people in? The fossil record in general is typically asserted as evidence for common descent. What, what category would that fall into? Well, it's, it's certainly historical science, but, um, you know, it's funny because prior to James Hutton, um, the fossil record was still there, but all the geologists uh, interpreted it as evidence of a global flood. So it's it's funny how now we're being told it's evidence for the exact opposite. When uh, prior to the 1799 uh, publication of James Hutton's work, um, you know, it wasn't the case. Suddenly it was back then it was evidence for Noah's flood. Uh, you know, I think when you look at operational science, we don't see fossils forming today unless it's in catastrophic situations and we can find, you know, where things have been covered by fast moving minerals and sediments and they've been permineralized, uh, you know, and it hasn't taken millions of years. So uh, I think the burden of proof is on somebody who's trying to claim that a an animal can lay down and die and lay on the ground and somehow... Uh, you know, it's not going to decompose and, and scavengers aren't going to get to it. And it's going to just going to turn into this nice fossil for us without there being catastrophic burial involved. Right. Great point. You know, before I start bringing people in, Dr. Rob Sadler, he has an excellent book here. He, he documents in the book that they actually um, accidentally, they, they took many separate species of dinosaurs, basically, where they classified uh, different species, but it turned out to be different levels of maturity of hmm. the same dinosaur species. So they had infants, adolescents, and adults of the same, I, I feel like it was U Tyrannus, I can't remember, but they incorrectly classified them as, as separate species. And be, Well, that kind of goes, that goes right along with what I said about the fruit bat skull in my presentation. Right. right. And, and that's what reminded me of that point, because the fossil record is it's very low quality, low confidence science. We don't have genetics to uh, determine ancestry. Genetics would, would be real time empirical uh, evidence or a way to determine ancestry. But yeah, so so many points uh, that you made that were excellent, Paul. Uh, I'll, I'll start bringing people in one by one. We got a good amount of people backstage. Sure. And, and I, so. I you know, I got maybe maybe 45 minutes to an hour, you know, to where I can devote. So perfect. OK, well, we will bring in the first guest and Brian from the Apologetics 101 YouTube channel. It's good to see you, brother. I appreciate all the uh, work that you're doing over on your channel. And so this isn't your first time here in one of the open mics, but for anybody who might be unfamiliar with you, give yourself a brief introduction and then present Paul with, with your question or even comment. All right, uh, can, am I coming in good? 
Yes. All right. Awesome. Um, my name is Brian Bowen. I have a uh, YouTube channel called Apologetics 101. Uh, right now we're doing a, um, a pretty good, pretty incredible uh, series on Genesis called the Genesis series. And so that's what we're working on right now. Um, and I have a website. Um, right now I'm updating it and making changes to it and stuff like that. I'll check um, that out. But uh, Paul. All right. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, on historical and operational science. Um, one of the things that I end up encountering is that a lot of atheists seem to end up thinking that like evolution and things like that are dealing with empirical science. They think that they can empirically prove a past event. Um, what is your uh, response to somebody who thinks that, because uh, I, I don't know if you run across this. Does atheists actually don't realize that empirical science and historical science are not the same thing? Do they actually think that you can empirically evaluate a past event in the same way like we send people to the moon and, and so forth? Oh, well, it's just not the case. I mean, you think about any claim about the past. Uh, you can get, uh, if, if you go out into the field and you look for clues for that, uh, it's entirely possible to get a false positive where you get something that is uh, in accordance with your hypothesis, and yet your hypothesis could still be wrong. And on the other hand, you can get false negatives where in the sense that you you fail to find the evidence that you expected to find, and yet your hypothesis could still turn out to be correct. And in my presentation, I gave an example about the crime scene where you know, well, let's say you go out and you look for fingerprints and you fail to find the suspect's fingerprints at the crime scene. Well, does that mean that you've disproved the crime? Do you, does that mean you've disproved that the that the suspect committed the crime? No, because there are so many ways that you can explain why it turns out that those fingerprints weren't found there. So, you know, and on the other hand, let's say that the suspect is innocent and yet you do find his fingerprints at the crime scene. Does that prove that he's not innocent? Well, not really, because what if he just so happened to be there for a different reason? Or what if the the, the true killer, you know, went to some great extent to like uh, lift some fingerprints from somebody else and try to frame that person by by putting his fingerprints on the crime scene when he was never even there? So the point I'm just making is that uh, you cannot prove or disprove past events, period. Right. Um, scientific not using good not using the science, present, not using historical man. science. I mean, if God if God yeah. tells us something, yeah, that proves it, you know, because God said it. But but short of that, you know, we can't use science to prove and disprove claims about the past. No, you use historical evidence. It's it just we can't use scientific one. Is that correct? I mean, I, I'm not saying you can't use evidence. You know, you, you have to always be careful with your words. You can certainly get evidence for things, and you can certainly evaluate statements about the past using evidence. I'm not claiming you can't, uh, but in terms of it having this criterion of falsifiability and repeatability, it does not have those criteria. Right. Um, some uh, skeptics will try to get around that by saying, well, we can make inferences from a past event, like if you walk outside and you see the grass wet, then we could tell it was raining. But there are certain assumptions that are being applied, and that actually uh, shows that that to be the case because there could be other reasons for why the grass is wet, such as dew in the morning. Dew, or you know, what if somebody threw a bucket of water when you weren't looking? Or sprinkling. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sometimes I like I'll go to McDonald's and I'll see the parking lot all wet and I'll think it rained and then I realize they power washed their, their parking lot. There you go. Yeah. So that's what underdetermination means. When I talked about underdetermination, you know, the the evidence that we have for past events underdetermines our theories about the past. All right. All right. Uh, that was all I had. <laughs> Thank you. It was right. good to speak um, with you. You too. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Donnie. I will uh, see y'all later. Okay, Brian. Appreciate the questions. And thanks so much for joining.
We'll talk to you later. God bless. No problem. You too. All God right. Bless. We will. Okay. With that, we'll bring in our next guest. And so it looks like we've got a good mix of skeptics and non-skeptics. And so all are welcome as long as we keep the discussion cordial and professional. So Andrew, uh, you're definitely no stranger to this channel and debates and open mics. But again, for anybody unfamiliar with who you are, brief introduction, and then uh, pick a topic or a point for you and Paul to engage. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks for having me on. Is uh, my audio coming in all right so far? Yes. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Uh, I always like to, to make sure before I go on a rant or something. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Andrew. Um, I'm currently a uh, college student. Um, I like to do research on evolution, paleontology, cosmology, that sort of stuff. Um, sure. And as Donnie was saying, I've, I've interacted with a lot of creationists over the, the YouTube community over what, probably like the last couple of years. So definitely no stranger to uh, uh, the different arguments that have been put forth. But yeah, I'm here to have a good discussion, hopefully, and uh, bring some points of contention I, I might have some of what you said, Paul. Sure. We, can discuss that. we got a couple minutes to, to, to do that with. Let's see what you got. Yeah. So um, you brought up the, the soft tissue topic and right. the question I, well, um, if I may, I kind of want to go along this uh, line of inquiry, if that makes sense. So I, I might ask a few questions just to, to kind of introduce the, the, the main sure. argument. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so you said that soft tissue is evidence free earth, correct? Uh, could According you repeat you. that? Uh, you broke up there for a second. Soft tissue oh, is sorry. what? So, so according to your view, soft tissue is evidence for a young earth. Uh, it would be because, specifically because, the soft tissue is found in bones that are also found in layers that have been uh, radiometrically dated to, you know, millions of years old. So, in, in that way, they essentially um, they they do not comport with radiometric dating being a uh, reliable way of of actually dating rock. Okay, and and I'm also going to assume that part of your inference that the the soft tissues can't last that long is based on protein experiments that have been done today, right? Like how long collagen or so forth can last in a, in certain under certain conditions. Well, yeah, but this is this is operational science because we can absolutely observe, you know, the decay of soft tissue and all of these various biomolecules. It doesn't require us to wait millions of years. We can observe the rate that it decays. And, and that's why this doesn't require the same level of assumption making, because we can actually test and repeat this. We're talking about what happens right. in the present. So Right. So my argument here, just to kind of cut to the chase, is basically right. you're saying from your younger creation perspective, we've done these experiments today. The proteins supposedly don't last this long. So when we apply that to the past, they couldn't have lasted millions of years. What I want to know is how that's any different from, say, looking at uh, inheritance patterns between individuals or between different species or populations today and applying that uh, that generally to the past in terms of common ancestry, the fossil record, whatnot. Like, uh, how is how is there a difference there? It, it kind of seems like you're, you're picking and choosing a little bit, if that makes sense. Uh, I mean, well, you're comparing... You're comparing soft tissue with uh, an inference to genetic ancestry over time. I'm, well, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm not sure I understand have... the connection there. Like, the reason I'm saying it's well, different like, is because to... it is testable and it is repeatable. You know, if you want right, to test like, what, how what I'm long saying these... is like today in the present, we can do actual lab experiments, whatnot. Say, so like, okay, you are the father, or you can do. Uh, like we can clearly see, okay, inheritance follows certain patterns today. Like that you would count as observational science. 
And we're then applying that, extrapolating that to the past, to historical science. So my question is, how is that any different then from what you're doing with soft tissues, extrapolating these, these protein experiment findings? Well, I think what you need to realize is that I'm not basing my belief about the age of the earth uh, on these extrapolations. My belief about the age of the earth comes from eyewitness testimony. And that eyewitness right, that's, testimony that's, that's is not it, what I was asking. Though. Well, the you, difference you said is the younger evidence is or part of that is soft tissue, right? That's what I was talking about specifically. Yeah, but I specifically said that all of those arguments I was using depend upon extrapolation, which I don't advocate for uh, making that our primary way of knowing things. What I what I said is that the, the real reason we know the earth is young is that the Bible tells us it is, and the Bible is eyewitness testimony from God himself. As far as the extrapolation goes, uh, what I'm pointing out is that evolutionists have to cherry pick the data. If they want to start extrapolating, why is it that they only want to talk about radiometric dating, but they don't want to talk about helium in the atmosphere, they don't want to talk about ocean salinity, they don't want to talk about rock arches uh, corroding, they don't want to talk about the, the fact that bone collagen has been tested. Well, right, but not, in, not, not getting in into all way. that right now, but like soft tissue specifically, are you saying then that that's not necessarily evidence for a young earth in this case? Because what it sounds like you're saying is you're, you're basing justification for a young earth, like you said, on, on your faith. Um, but then you're saying extrapolation isn't warranted then. So how, how then can you say, for example, with not just like soft tissue, like you were saying, but these other kinds of claims, how can you extrapolate from what we know today into the past and make basically the same kind of argument that evolution uh, believers are, are saying with all these other things. Like, it, it doesn't really seem like you're being consistent here. Well, I think it's the exact opposite. I'm pointing out that evolutionists are not being consistent. It, it, have you ever heard the phrase, what's good for the goose is good for the gander? I mean, it, if the evolutionist oh, sure. wants to tell us that extrapolation works, then let them not cherry pick the data. I'm not saying that we can determine the age of the earth using extrapolation. So, you know, the, the fact that we find soft tissue, that doesn't tell us how old the earth is. At the very best, it might give us an upper limit, but even that does depend upon assumptions. So it's not an absolute proof. It is evidence, right, but right. it's not well, you, an absolute You did proof. say it's evidence for a young earth, right? That there, there are limits to its age, according to you. That's what I think. Yeah. Like there, there's a, there's a problem like this, is, this is a side note. This is another point I wanted to make about you saying there, there's no proof in historical science. Well, there isn't really proof. I, I think you would agree in experimental science either both involve error bars, probabilities, confidence levels, that sort of thing. Um, so, so I, I, what, what I'm trying to get at is if you want to say, yeah, um, soft tissue, is evidence for a young earth one way or another, How, however young it is, whatever number we want to assign to it. If you want to say soft tissue is evidence for a young earth based on those extrapolations, then you're going to also have to admit that the same types of extrapolations for evolution are also are, are, are consistent with that kind of reasoning. Yeah, that, that was Otherwise, the point of my presentation is that I was trying to get people to understand that all of these things are part of this overarching um, categorization of historical science. So when I talk about soft tissue finds uh, or unpermineralized dinosaur bone, that is historical science. It's not operational science. It can be based, like we can do operational science to see today what is the decay rate of, you know, soft tissue and bone? Now, if you want to present to me evidence that the decay rate of bone and soft tissue was significantly different in the past, then I, I await your evidence. But I haven't ever heard anybody well, claim. Well, that's, that's kind of my, my point, though. If you're saying these soft tissue arguments are based on historical science, then why are you using them? Because I'm I, not I guess saying I'll, I'll put we it can't. Simply that way. 
Yeah, I think you're misunderstanding me. I'm not saying that creationists or I'm not saying that people should not use historical science. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we should recognize the limits of historical science and we should recognize that historical science is less reliable than operational science and that both of them are collectively less reliable than believing what God says. So if you want to put it this way, number one in reliability, God's word. Uh, below that would just be any type of eyewitness testimony. Below that would then be historical science. So I'm not saying we can't use historical science. I'm saying that it needs to be understood for what it is and that we need to understand the limits of what it can do. Does that make sense? Well, then, yes, but like, let me just throw this question back at you. Why should I trust what you're saying about these historical evidences for a young earth then? Why is that any different? Are you talking about the the soft tissue? Soft tissue, all, like any any of these uniformitarian extrapolations that you're making, which aren't, don't necessarily hold over those time periods, like you're saying. How do you how, how do you justify that? Like, what why? Well, I mean, go yeah. go read the articles. I, I'm not asking you to believe it because I said it. That you know, that's not the argument. If you want to well, check it out, go to. I, I wasn't I mean, saying that either. I was. Why should I consider it reliable, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, because, because we can observe this occurring. We can observe the, um, the decay of these biomolecules. That's what Dr. Brian Thomas did for but his But I thought you just said the extrapolations weren't always warranted then you're saying they're less reliable but they're here you are saying warranted. that these particular but, extrapolations are reliable like what why why are you kind of picking and choosing here that's my point i i'm telling you that i believe that the extrapolations show an upper limit but if you have evidence what i'm not hearing from you is any type of you know actually addressing of this evidence. You're just saying, well, why should I believe it? Well, the reason you should believe it is that we can observe decay rates happening and it doesn't take millions of years. You can observe it. Go well, well we watch, can also uh, observe you know, inheritance patterns today. So why why don't you I mean, accept have you ever have you ever seen roadkill like on the side of the road? Sure. I mean you does it just sit there or does it visibly decay pretty quickly? I mean this I mean, is observable. Sure. But why, why should I extrapolate that over millions of years? Like you're saying, if we can't extrapolate, say, inheritance patterns over millions of years. What, what's I mean, I don't think you should extrapolate it over millions of years because the earth isn't millions of years old. But how do you know is, it's not millions of years then? I, I, I think I've kind of made my point here, Donnie. I don't I don't know what else we can okay. say on this. Gentlemen, yeah, I put it in the side chat a couple more minutes until the next guest. And so, Andrew, I do appreciate you joining us. We've got right. several more uh, guests in the back. And so, as always, Andrew, appreciate you being here. And we look forward to having you in future open mics. So with that, let's bring in the next guest. And so we have BMZ next on the open mic panel. And so BMZ, just like Andrew, you're no stranger to these open mics. You have been here several times in the past and we do always appreciate when skeptics are willing to engage these topics the topic of, of origin specifically so bmz quick intro and then if you, if you had a question or a specific point you wanted to make to paul based on his presentation go ahead well good morning my name is dr given kimmy's kind i am a doctorate of geoscience and physical geology from the university of new south wales yes nice to meet you in the aspect of your redefining of sciences into historical and observational sciences, the definition falls apart when you look at the experiments that were done by John Snow during the 1800s in regards to cholera. In what no way? Has, now, hold on, before we get to the cholera thing, you just said that I redefined science, but I did you watch my presentation? I quoted from an evolutionary philosopher of science 
who used this distinction, Dr. Carol Cleland, I didn't redefine science. This is simply how science is understood at, by philosophers of science. Yes, but philosophers of science are exactly that. They're a soft science within philosophy. They're not scientists. So you're telling me that the philo philosophy of science is not like we, we should it's just referred throw that to out? As a, no, it's referred to as a soft science. Okay, so that means we should throw it out. It's false because it's not it's not a hard science. No, soft science has their uses, but it has no f use when you're actually working in earth sciences. So when Dr. Carol Cleland says historiographic science deals with particular events and oper or uh, experimental science deals with regularities in events, you're saying we should throw that out. Well, you can actually use historical science for regular events as well. That's how they do were able think, to find Do you think we should throw out Dr. Carol Cleland's distinction that she made? No, because it's a good thought process in the same so way. Then I, so then I didn't redefine science. Are you taking that back then? No. You're not going to take it back. Science is defined more often as hard science and soft science. Hard science is something that I do, something within geology. Soft science are more of the aspects within the thoughts and ideals. Yeah, I understand. But what Dr. Carol Cleland was talking about was not limited to soft science. She was speaking about hard science. Do you understand that, right? She was not speaking about soft science. Yeah, she was, she was offering a thought experiment. Science. She was offering a thought experiment. No, it wasn't a thought experiment. It was a definition of two different types of hard science. Or if you want to, if you want to use that distinction, we can say that uh, operational science is a hard science, and historical science is a soft science. We could put it that way. No, both are just science. Neither of them are hard or soft because no, that that's, science is you, science. that is not the case. And you've already agreed that Carol Cleland's should not be thrown out, but then you're contradicting yourself in the next word when you say that it's not correct. If, if it should be thrown out, why should it be thrown out? It should not be thrown out in the same way that a lot of Sigmund Freud's aspects shouldn't be thrown out, in the same way that Newton's aspect of gravity shouldn't be thrown out. A lot of those things are wrong. But so they Dr. Have Carol purposes. Cleland is wrong. You're, you're going to go on record and saying she's wrong. No, you're misinterpreting her thought experiment. No, I, I definitely did not misinterpret her. Absolutely not. She she very clearly described two different types of science. She called one of them historiographic science. I just call it historical science, but I mean the same thing by it that she does. And the other one is called experimental or operational science. But Do you, you think she was wrong to make that distinction? You cannot make that distinction when it comes to hard sciences. because That is exactly what Dr. Cleland argued that you must do. Are then you saying she is she's incorrect wrong? in that? Then she is incorrect in that statement because we don't dif differentiate between the two. According to her, you do. It's just that you know. Unfortunately, this proves the point. In my in my presentation, I said that um, there is unfortunately a disconnect between understanding how science works. That's what philosophy of science does, and actually doing the science. And sadly, the universities fail to teach the the scientists who are involved in hard science how science actually works in a philosophical level. They just teach them how to do the experiments and how to write the papers, but they don't teach them the critical thinking that goes behind it. That's what philosophy of science is about, and that's what Dr. Carol Cleland was writing about. And by you coming on here and saying she was wrong, but not giving any reason why other than we don't make that distinction, you're just proving my point that unfortunately hard science you know it, it has a lot of catching up to do to understand the basic critical aspect of how science works in a logical sense that's what philosophy of science is about philosophy means love of wisdom so if you don't you know if you don't if you're not willing to think about these things in a critical way i'm sorry that's that's not to your benefit that's not to to the benefit of science when making experimentations, we rely on the evidence. That's just what it relies on. If you start bringing your own personal bias into it, it fails. I agree. That's my, that's the whole point of my presentation tonight. That's what I was getting at.
that's why we don't separate the difference between historical science and observational science. If you don't separate the two, you're not going to understand where your biases come in. You're not going to understand that when you when you are looking at past events that you cannot falsify and you cannot repeat, then your biases are going to start to control your interpretations of that evidence. That is not true because we can actually use experimentation to prove past events. How? Are you aware of the process of lithification? Uh, lithification. The, is that the, the formation of strata? Or Tell me what you, what you mean by it's, it. It's one of the processes with the formation of strata. You go through deposition, deposit, compression, then lithification. Okay. What, what's, what, what is the point you're making there? Lithification is something that we cannot truly observe out in the field, but we can actually use things like a flume chamber to create lithification processes and actually repeat the experiments both on a small and a large scale. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Guy Bertol? He, he's done uh, flume chamber experiments. Guy Bertol has shown us how uh, uh, strata can form in visible layers quickly. That's operational science. So uh, the, the old, you know claim that looking at layers of strata proves that they had to be laid down separately over an extended period of time. That is not the case when you look at Guy Bertol's experiments showing that actually it's the hydro, um, hydro, what is the word, hydromechanical sorting of the different types and sizes and densities of material that causes the quick deposition of visible stratified layers you don't have to take millions of years to do it. Now, that may not be what you were taught, but again, that's why you need to understand the difference between historical and operational science. You need to understand how biases are being basically swept under the rug or, or brought in secretly, like, like pork barrel spending in a really huge uh, you know, bill that, that the politicians have to vote on. These, these biases are being smuggled in, and you're not even aware that you're being indoctrinated into these biases because you're not thinking about this in the right way. You need to understand, uh, and I hope you will really seriously consider the points that I made and the points even that Dr. Carol Cleland makes in her essays on the philosophy of science and, and her uh, distinction there. In any final, to the any final questions or remarks there? And then we'll move to the next caller. You can go move to the next call because you haven't actually answered anything. In regards to the multiple layers, that has, has easily been disproved. The aspect of using a flume chamber to create multiple layers is easy to do. But it's more of the aspect of the deposition as well as the lithification process that takes a large amount of time. How do you know that it takes a large amount of time? Because we did a lot of a long term experiment over 50 years to show that how it works. 50 years is you're calling that a large amount of time? 50 years? Yes. On a That's small a, scale, okay. it is a lot, it is a large amount of time when you're working with those sort of processes. Well, okay. So I'm willing to take that 50 years. All right. It takes 50 years to make uh, the strata. Let's go no, for that. The strata wasn't actually formed yet. It was just a demonstration. So of you how didn't actually, actually observe the formation of the strata then? Well, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't alive at the beginning of the experiment. Well, you said that the experiment lasted 50 years. The, f the experiment is still ongoing. How long has it been going? 50 years. Well, <laughs> okay. 53 years and six months now. All right. Well, call me in 500 million years, and then we'll call it operational science. Until then, it's it's obviously historical science. And how do you define it as historical science? Because it's not being observed. We're observing it right now. You're not observing the formation of strata that takes millions of years. Otherwise, if you were, it would take millions of years to make the observation. The fact that you're saying it hasn't been observed, I, I mean, how can I make the point any more clear than that? It's not being observed. And again, back to my original point, which I asked you about, Jon Snow didn't make any observation towards cholera, but he is accepted as the founder of it. Paul, why don't you get a final response and then we'll bring in the next guest. 
Okay. Um, I, I off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with this this John Snow and cholera. I don't see how it really has anything to do with this. But um, you know, maybe if we get another chance in the future to converse, I will have had a chance to to look into this and and figure out how this is somehow relevant. But I do appreciate getting the chance to uh, speak to you here. I do hope you will. Uh, if you didn't watch my presentation in an, in its entirety, I hope you will go back and do so. And feel free to check out the writings of Dr. Carol Cleland uh, for more on that. Beamsy, appreciate you joining the show. And uh, thanks for the questions and, and a really good back and forth with Paul. So far, it's been a great open mic and, and an excellent panel. So with that, uh, Beamsy, you have a good night. We'll bring in the next guest. And so the next guest we have is Jackson Rowe. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, skeptics on the panel so far who are no stranger to, to this show. So Jackson, you've done many debates yep. and discussions and you've been here for many open mics. So it's great to have you back. Brief great intro and then um, pick a point or topic to, to kind of go back and forth with Paul a little bit on. All right, my channel is called Jackson Rowe. It's uh, probably should have thought of a more creative name than that. And uh, uh, anyway, I I do like sometimes there's such a thing as being too creative. So that's true. Yeah. Anyway, I want to make a couple comments. Uh, you were talking about contamination, and then I want to ask a question. But a couple comments, like uranium lead dating, like dating uh, zircons for uranium lead. There's there's no contamination because zircon doesn't form with lead. So any lead that's found in the sample would be radiogenic in nature to, to the sample. It means it would have had to have formed in the zircon. I want to say that. And then uh, if the speed of light can change, as you're suggesting, uh, that pretty much shatters relativity. I mean, I mean, we can probably take this equation right here and just like, like throw it away. Because... I mean, maybe it does. Uh, I'm not sure. I wasn't making a claim to knowledge. Mm -hmm. Rather, I was showing that people who are making claims to knowledge have an insufficient foundation to do so. Um, the, the speed of light may, as, as if you'll go watch that Veritasium video, uh, it has to do not, we're, we're talking about an overall cosmology and it's possible for the, for the equations to work out such that, uh, you know, it's possible for light to move in a different way in one direction in the universe as opposed to uh, in the opposite direction in the universe. And I'm not claiming that I know how that works, and I'm not claiming that that is necessarily correct or that it is that way. I'm just saying we can't prove it one way or the other. And so the fact that we can't prove that one way or the other means we can't... Um, atheists should not be claiming that distant starlight somehow disproves the Bible because it simply doesn't. We don't know enough about the universe and the way light works to know whether that is a defeater or not. Does that make All sense? Right. Sure. Let me let me bring one more thing from cosmology in before I get to my real point and then I'll I'll be on my way. Yeah. Uh, it appears that some stars with were created with the appearance of age, like red supergiants. Uh, when a star ages they get bigger, they expand because they run out of hydrogen. And they start fusing helium. Now, the way they can tell they're actually fusing helium is they do spectroscopy of the light coming from the stars. They do know from observation that they're fusing the helium at that point. So that would mean stars have an estimated lifespan based on their mass of billions of years. Most of them. Some of them last for like super giant, some super giants, maybe a hundred million years. But the point is it's way longer than 6,000 years. So do you believe these stars were created with the appearance of great age? Uh, well, no, and for two reasons. First of all, when you say appearance of age, that implies something that isn't necessarily the case. Like, for example, um, was Adam created with the appearance of age just because God uh, created him as a fully grown man and not as a zygote? I would say no, because the age there is an assumption that you're putting on there. It's not God's fault. Like if you look at Adam and you assume Adam is 30 years old just because he's fully grown, 
that doesn't mean God was tricking you, okay? That just means that you're making a false assumption of age. Uh, and the point I'm making there is that let's say God did create a star in in that stage of, of late, quote-unquote, late life stage for whatever reason. I don't know the mind of God. I don't know why God created exactly what he did, how he did, when he did. But if he did do that, uh, it's not fair to say that is, quote-unquote, an appearance of age and then say, well, God is tricking us. No, you're the one making the assumption of age, and it's not God's fault if that assumption happens to be wrong. Um, another possibility, I'm not as into this, but Dr. Russell Humphreys has had a theory in his book, Starlight and Time, about uh, you know possibly what if during the creation week God used a an event horizon of a black hole and it caused um, like accelerated movement of time. And I'm not necessarily endorsing that theory, but I only bring it up for the same reason that I brought up the, the Veritasium video. There are ways of possibly explaining uh, these cosmological things that we ob observe that do not require us to abandon the Bible. So I don't have to like hang my hat on any one particular theory. I'm only simply making the point that none of these so-called defeaters of the Bible are actually defeaters, if that makes sense. They're all based on all right. assumptions that you're just bringing to the table. All right, I want to I want to get to my real point uh, before okay. I don't want to take up too much time because I know someone's waiting in line. Go ahead. Uh, okay, you've heard of the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. They what they find there, their their age is estimated to be a few tens of thousands of years old, something like that. What they find there are mammoths, uh, ground sloths, dire wolves, saber toothed cats. Now, if everything lived on Earth at the same time, and this goes for permafrost too, or other tar pits, there are a few in the world. Uh, why are we only finding things like large mammals that are called, you know, the Ice Age era mammals the, of the, you know, the recent times, relatively, and not things like Stegosaurus and Apatosaurus and and you know duck duck bills and and you know all kinds of T Rex and what are why are we not finding these in the tar pits or in the permafrost? Well, uh, okay. So the question is, why are we not finding reptiles like dinosaurs in the in the tar pits? So the creationist understanding of the fossil record is that the majority of the fossil record was deposited catastrophically at the time of Noah's flood. However, uh, there is some of the very upper part of the fossil record that would have been deposited in the receding stages of the flood and in the period after the flood called the Ice Age. And so it sounds to me like the, the tar pits would be more of an ice age thing than a flood thing per se. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't point to the tar pits as an example of, you know, Noah's flood. We would say that is an ice age artifact. And there, there are many reasons why we might see different animals during the ice age, which was immediately after the flood compared to before the flood. Um, and for another thing, you know, it may just be that those happen to be the types of animals living in that particular biome that got that happened to get preserved in those tar pits. Um, so, you know, it might just be that simple. It's just, well, that's what was there. Why don't we find a stegosaurus there? Because a stegosaurus wasn't there. <laughs> I mean, it's there. You don't need any more explanation than that. But, uh, you know, in the time after the flood, you would have seen. Uh, a period of extremely large amounts of glaciation on the planet, high amounts of snowfall, because the, the flood was a period of extreme volcanism and, and cataclysmic tectonic activity. So the, all of this together would have had two effects. It would have warmed up the oceans, and it would have blanketed the Earth in a nuclear winter type of effect because of all the uh, smoke going into the atmosphere from all of the volcanism and all of that type of thing. So what does those two things equal? 
blocking out the rays of the sun and warming up the oceans gives you an ice age. Only one. One ice age after the flood. And it's very hard for old earthers to agree on how to explain how you get an ice age to begin with. But it actually makes plenty of sense if you understand that we had a global flood. It warmed up the oceans. It blocked out the sun for a period of time. And that gives you increased precipitation as well as colder atmospheric temperatures, resulting in increased snowfall and glaciation. Those, all of those things together would uh, certainly create conditions more conducive to the survival of furry mammals uh, than it would be to large reptiles, I think. So all of these things kind of play together in explaining or, or trying to tackle uh, your, your question there. Does that help at all? All right, why not Cretaceous age like small mammals? Why are they not found in the tar pits then? Well, the short answer is that they didn't fall into the tar pit. I mean, right. that's the reason. All right. I well, don't know why they weren't there. I couldn't tell let's, you. Uh, let me give just an example from the fossil record, not so much the tar pit, even though that is the fossil record. But let's say, uh, why are there no trilobites above the Permian? They're, they're found from the Cambrian to the Permian. And then there's a mass extinction event, or we believe there's a mass extinction event. And they're not found in any layer above the, what that Permian boundary. Another well, example, it, uh, one more, sorry. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Sharp teeth are never found below the Devonian, but they're found in every layer above the Devonian. Did you say shark teeth? Shark teeth. Okay. But sharks are still alive today. Yes, and they've been around since the Devonian. But wouldn't that prove my point that the fossil no. record is not is not a record of change over time no because they're they've been uh, quite different throughout time not the same species of sharks haven't been around since the development but you just said that there were no shark teeth found in the fossil record after what age sorry no nope, no nope. before the devonian there are no shark teeth oh no. i'm sorry i had yeah. it backwards my fault so before the devonian there were no shark teeth hmm. after the devonian we found them we find That's them in every, every layer, yeah. Okay, and you're suggesting that means that they must have evolved in the Devonian? Or I'm saying, why are there no shark, if they existed always, why are there no shark teeth in the Cambrian, which is mostly marine deposits? Yeah. Uh, the fossil well, livers there, it's all marine deposits. I think the thing that is behind the sort of unspoken assumption that's behind your question Mm -hmm. is that you're still thinking of the fossil record in terms of slow, gradual deposition, because that's how you've sort of been programmed to think about the fossil record through the media and through science textbooks and so on and so forth. If you well, take those glasses off for a second and understand the creation view of the fossil record is that it was all formed or almost all formed in a very short period of time due to catastrophic circumstances. When you understand that, you, you suddenly realize you have to throw out this idea that vertical position in the layers equals time component. What it really equals is geographic location component as well as hydrologic sorting component. So there are two complex factors at work here. One, the, 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 floods, uh, the flood waters would have risen and they would have progressively buried things according to their proximity to the, uh, to the shoreline. And so there is a, a geographic element in the fossil record, starting with marine life at the bottom, because it, it started in the ocean, and then from there progressively going on to land. So there's a geographic element, but then there's also a, a hydrologic sorting element of you know, you've got churning water and you've got certain things that are going to sink to the bottom more readily and other things are going to float more readily. And so when you combine these complex different factors together, you're going to see that there's no way we can possibly hope to interpret the fossil record with any degree of certainty. Like, why don't we find shark teeth before the Devonian? I don't know. It's impossible to know because you can't repeat a global flood. You can't repeat that event. You can't test that event. You can speculate about it, but ultimately 
all we're doing here is speculating. The hard fact is we have a record of history that says it happened. Jackson, so I think we should accept that record instead of trying to claim that we're smarter than the people that were there and told us it happened. You know, why don't we just believe those people, even if you don't want to think that it's inspired by God, which I do. But even if you don't think that, why not believe the people who were closer to the event as opposed to modern day people who were not there and certainly don't have access to all the evidence? As I pointed out in my talk, we're losing evidence over time. Jackson. I think I think, I think mm -hmm. we're out of time for this caller, and I'm right. I'm getting close to the end of my time right, here I'll, this evening. So let's we'll, uh, wrap we it up get a, there the next next person. All but right. yeah, it was good to meet you, Jackson. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. You. Yeah. All right, Jackson. Thank you as always for join joining. I do appreciate your time and the time from anybody who who has decided to join us. So we got two more guests, and then we will uh, wrap it up, Paul. So you're doing a great job. You're earning your open mic badge tonight, that's for sure. Okay, so uh, Jackson, see you later. And next on the panel, we've got our uh, main event for tonight. Dr. Dan Dr. probably Dan. needs no introduction, but feel free to, uh, Dr. Dan, introduce yourself. Actually, firstly, been a while, long time, no see and talk. Hope you've been well. And so brief intro and then pick a topic for, for Paul. Hey, thank you. Um, sorry, I sound terrible. I'm getting over something. So my voice is all, it's not fun tonight, but, um, Paul, it's, it's a sorry pleasure to, to meet you in person. We go way back on Reddit, Donnie, you probably don't know that, but me and Paul, we've, we've been friends since years and years. We go way back. So Paul, it's really nice to, to talk to you in person. I know you're getting near the end of your time. You've been on for a while, so I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but I really, I really appreciate, um, actually kind of the, the way that your conversation with Jackson just went there because it was a perfect lead into what I want to talk about. What you just said a minute ago was looking at past events. All we're doing is speculating and the, big thing I want to point out to everybody is we are absolutely not just speculating when we're talking about past events and figuring out what happened in the past. You can absolutely draw really, really strong conclusions about what happened in the past. Sorry, I really sound terrible. I apologize, everybody. Um, what... <laughs> um, what we can do in the like it, when we're doing science like the actual practice of science the key thing that we want to be able to do is make testable predictions and then test those predictions so we can make predictions uh, about things that have to be the case if certain events happened in the past and then evaluate those predictions to determine if our hypothesis about these past events is either supported and, and reasonable or refuted right and, and likely not true um, I only caught the very beginning of this. <clears throat> Sorry, everybody. I only caught the very beginning of this. And um, I know you were talking about radiometric dating at one point. And the example I want to use is radiometric dating. It's not my field, um, but it's a really cool example. So I really, I really like it. Are you familiar with the Oklo nuclear reactors? Have you heard about this, this thing? The Oklo nuclear reactors. I'm not sure I'm familiar yeah. with it. Oh man. It's, it's like, it is legitimately one of the coolest things that's ever happened on earth so the oklo natural nuclear reactors are a it's a formation in uh oklo in gabon in central africa and it's a, a uranium mine in the 1970s they're mining uranium and basically they determined based on the isotopes that they found that it had undergone naturally occurring uh, i think the i think the technical if i want to be technically correct about it, i think it was light water nuclear fission as would happen in a nuclear power plant but it occurred naturally in these formations and the really cool thing is that they determined that this happened 1.7 billion years ago now obviously nobody was there to see it right but because we can make predictions about if that's the case then a bunch of things have to be true we can evaluate if that is something that actually happened to the point where we can be about as sure that this is a thing that happened as we are about anything you can see in front of your face. So here's here's what happened. So normally in uh, uranium now, the, the fissionable isotope of uranium is, two is a U-235 is what they use in like power plants. And when you mine it now, the 
uh, that, that uranium, it, it decays naturally. So it's only present at like 0.7 something percent. Uh, but when they mined it in Oklo in the 70s, it was lower than that. It was like 0.6 something, whatever it was. There was a discrepancy there and everyone kind of freaked out a little bit because like it was a, it was a French operation and they were making nuclear weapons and you got to account for all your uranium, right? So everyone freaked out a little bit and they had to figure out what happened to the missing uranium. And what they, what they determined, they said, it sure looks like it fissioned away, like it did a nuclear power plant, right? It didn't decay faster. It fissioned, it split. Uh, in this kind of artificial way. Um, if that's the case, then all of there's a whole bunch of things that have to be true, right? So if that happens, you can kind of wind back the clock based on the decay rate and say the most recent time it would have been at a high enough concentration to do fission would have been 1.7 billion years ago. So let's say 1.7 billion. And then if that happened, what else has to be true, right? So if we did fission, at 1.7 billion years ago, and it worked the same way back then that fission works today, and the, the nuclear decay works the same way since then to present as it does today, and neutron capture, this other process where uh, nuclei can increase in mass rather than decrease, if that works the same, right? All okay. these things working the same way since then, we can predict very precisely what other isotopes we ought to see in that formation, right, that are weird except for the fact that this fission occurred in a certain quantity. And we know the yeah, quantity I, based on I the missing follow, I, I think right? I follow what you're getting at here. The problem yeah, so is... The, well, the punchline, Paul, is that we all of these predictions are dead on accurate, and they're all independent of each other, right? So the fact that fission works the same way is independent of uh, uh, decay working the same way. Decay and fission are independent of neutron capture, which confirms that the fine structure constant has actually been constant for 1.7 billion years. They tested like literally dozens of isotopes when they were figuring out what was going on here. Different uranium isotopes, xenon. Uh, my favorite is samarium, where it was samarium 150 was enriched from 149 based on the exact amount of neutron capture you would expect from fission of the exact amount of missing uranium. So this is what you would call historical science, right? It's something that happened in the past, but nobody was there to observe it. We didn't directly do an experiment, but we can make predictions that are extremely specific. And when all of these different predictions are confirmed, we have a pretty good idea of what happened at that time in the past. That's, I would love yeah, to hear your I, answer. I, I follow what you're saying. So and I'm, obviously... Um, since I'm not familiar with this particular set of claims that you're making here about the Okla reactor and all of these different things, I'm not going to be able to give you a detailed response like off the cuff right now on this specific topic. Uh, I'll definitely look into this and uh, possibly, you know, talk about this in the future in an, in a future open mic or a future presentation or whatever. Um, but I can make some statements generally about the types of statements that you were just making. And one of the places where you can sneak in bias without realizing it is when you make statements like, it would have to be the case that. And that is that is the type of statement that, you know, you have to be careful because you may be incorrect about that and you may be basing it on uh, assumptions that you don't even realize you're making when you say, it would have to be the case that. Um, so th that type of language, uh, when you're talking about, again, something that has not been observed and it's not only millions, but billions of years in the past, to, to make a kind of statement, it would have to be the case, is, is a definite example of hubris that happens with people without realizing that they're, that they're overstating their own knowledge. Um, specifically, I saw in the... I saw in the the chat where you stated that there is no that 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 there is no distinction between operational and historical science. Is that right? I don't want to go down the um, the philosophy of science rabbit hole. I'd rather keep things kind of focused on. I mean that the that's the topic of this. Of science. Yeah, but that that is the topic of this of the presentation I gave, and I did see where you stated that 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 the entire distinction is made up. Is that yeah, what you in the practice, practice of science, yeah, when you're doing science, it doesn't matter historical or operational. It's all the same. The point is that you're able to make testable predictions about 
occurrences, right? And it doesn't matter if those occurrences are things that you're doing in a Petri dish in the lab, or if those are occurrences that happened 1.7 billion years ago in a uranium mine in Central Africa. It doesn't matter. The point is that you can make accurate predictions. And to what you said a moment ago, you said uh, the kind of the assumption that's being snuck in here, right, is you can say it would have to be. Well, that's the whole point of the scientific method is you eliminate potential explanations. So you say, okay, uh, we can have an alternative explanation, for example, right? You could say, well, maybe the, the decay was more rapid for some reason, right? The, the uranium decay explains the discrepancy. It wasn't fission. It was this other thing. But if you have uh, decay that's inconsistent with the observations, right? We have direct observations of the isotopes that are there. Accelerated decay is inconsistent with those observations for two reasons. One, it doesn't account for the heat. And two, the decay chain, the isotopes that we would find are different from what we find as the products of fission. So we can eliminate that as a potential explanation, right? So when I say it would have to be, what I mean is that we can test a bunch of different hypotheses based on the direct observations we make, and we can eliminate the ones that are inconsistent with those observations. Yeah, you... For this particular site, the only hypothesis that's been proposed that is consistent with all of the observations is fission 1.7 billion years ago. Okay. I mean, I think you're making a statement that exceeds uh, the actual evidence. But again, since, uh, you know, this isn't something I've studied myself in the past, I can't go into a lot of detail on it. I will say that, you know, testable predictions are great. Uh, but the real thing that differentiates operational science from historical science is falsifiability. It's not mm -hmm. testable predictions. I mean, I can make testable predictions and I can be right about, you know, I can say if if a hobo went into my backyard last night, I'm going to make a testable prediction. He might have left a, uh, you know, an article of clothing behind that I would be able to find. So that would be a testable prediction. And then I could go into my backyard and I could look and I could actually find an article of clothing. And so my prediction uh, was confirmed. But does that prove that a hobo was really in my backyard last night? No. You know why? Because it could have been that one of my kids actually dropped that article of clothing and I just didn't recognize it. And so the point I'm making here not equate to a proof of your uh, that your hypothesis is correct. Uh, falsification is what we use in operational science. We don't prove something true. I'm sure you understand this as a scientist. You know, we don't prove scientific theories. We fail to disprove them, right? And so, but you can't disprove anything about the past. That is the distinction. I, so that so I totally agree that the the point uh, is falsifiability, and that's the point of these testable predictions is falsifiability. So, for example, it, it, that very last thing you said is where I take take issue. Right? We can disprove things about the past. One hundred percent, we can. Um, so, for example, in, in the 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 Oklo example, we've disproven that there was accelerated decay of uranium two thirty five there. Like that didn't happen because we know what decay of uranium-235 looks like. We know what the products of that are. And that's not what we yeah, find. You think you know all, all of these things, but you can't actually prove that you know it because you can't observe it. You, you, you have no way to do a sanity check other than, I would say. If um, I may, we can observe that, though. We, we can directly observe the fission of U-235. We know exactly what that is based on current yeah, observations. Now you can science. say, right. And now you can say, but it might've been different in the past. And what I'm, what I'm, the point of this example is so beautiful because it allows us directly to test. Does that, let's call it an assumption. Does that assumption that this process worked in the past, the same as it does in the present, it allows us to test that as a hypothesis, well, right? Because if the uh, products are different, right, from what we expect based on what we're proposing, then something else is happening there that we can't explain, yeah. right? But it's not. It's exactly what we would expect based on how these processes work in the present. So I totally agree with you that the point is falsifiability. Where I need to clarify, I think, is that the point of testable predictions is to provide that standard for falsifiability. And if, for example, in this, in this particular, you know, 
situation if there hadn't been the enriched uh, heavier isotope of samarium, then we could eliminate, we have falsified fission as an explanation for uh, the No, the because finding what you we expect to find doesn't prove that you're correct. Failing to did. find what you don't expect to find also doesn't prove you're correct. Not in I, history. I because there are, there are conceivable all. ways that, uh, unbeknownst to any of us, uh, some of the assumptions that you're making about what you think you should find could turn out to be false. That's why it's not really falsification. And uh, the, another point that I'll make is um, that uh, I am not merely saying that the K rates might have been different in the past. Now, that could be true. They might have been different, but that's not the only way we could go about uh, approaching this topic of radiometric decay. It's also possible that we simply don't know enough about how decay works in the present. I'm not even talking about it might have been different in the past. I'm saying our understanding of physics is incomplete. And so to, to suggest that we know enough about present processes to extrapolate them successfully over a span of time greater than anybody can even conceive of is very much an arrogant thing to do. And, and the, the billiard ball example I gave in my talk was try to try to show that point. You know, if we can't even successfully predict the motion of a billiard ball for more than a couple of seconds, then how is it that we think we're smart enough to say with confidence that something must be the case a billion years ago? I'm not willing to say that. I'm going to say I'm going to trust the historical record before I trust those types of speculations. And, and I do think, unfortunately, it does not speak uh, to your intellectual honesty that during my presentation, you went in there and made comments as I was speaking that, that this entire uh, thing that I'm talking about is made up, even as I was giving quotations from uh, secular evolutionary uh, scientists who are using, uh, they are using the distinction and they mean by it the same thing that I mean by it, but nonetheless, you continue to claim that it's a completely made up distinction. And unfortunately, that shows that um, you have been, uh, to a certain degree, indoctrinated not to think critically about this distinction. Uh, but with that, I don't think there's anything I've got more time to talk on with you tonight uh, as I'm running out of time here. But I do appreciate you bringing up the Oklo. How do you spell it? I'll, Oklo. I'll it. O K L O. Oklo. And Donnie, I have one. I have, if I may, Paul, I have one quick thing just to just to kind of leave you with, if that's yeah. okay. Um, because like I said, I'm not here to argue the distinction. I will just say on that that like scientists are not a monolith. Like we disagree about stuff. So yeah, philosopher of science can say whatever, and I can disagree, and that's that's how stuff works. Um, I I do agree. I want to agree with you though that like there could be some weird thing. Right. There could be some weird thing going on with Oklo and whatever. There could be some weird thing that we don't understand based on our current observations of how things like fission and decay and neutron capture work. That could totally be the case. I 100 percent agree with you. But I think it is weird that you would propose that as an explanation rather than going based on the processes that we can directly observe right in real time in the present and saying those based on our direct observations, probably are, right, the things that are operating. Because again, it's all about direct observation. Yeah, so I, I mean, think, that makes... I don't think we should appeal to things that we that, that are unknown and observable. Right? Well, I, I, think I understand. If we have observations, we should use those. I understand the point you're making there, uh, Dan, and, and I agree with you that if I were making that statement in a vacuum, it wouldn't hold a lot of water. Like if that were all we had to go on, um, then, you know, what leg would I have to stand on just by saying, well, you might be wrong, you know? Yeah, I can see that point, but we're not in a vacuum. We do have a historical record of what has happened on this earth. Mm -hmm. So I'm not willing to take those types of speculations as impressive as they may be. I'm not willing to jettison what the people that were there actually told us over those types of speculations. We have a, history, a, a historical document that, that tells us the history of this planet. It's called the Bible. And so 
you may feel that you're within your intellectual license to disregard the the history that it gives us. I don't. And I don't find these types of speculations sufficiently uh, convincing uh, to to cause me to want to disbelieve what God told us in his word actually happened. So that that's that's my response to you is that I'm not saying that in a vacuum. I have a higher authority that I'm appealing to that gives us the history of this planet from an eyewitness perspective. And that is always going to be more reliable than this, than people saying this must be the case because of such and such measurement. We think we, we can't imagine why we would be wrong here. Sorry. It doesn't, it doesn't overturn the Bible for me. I, I wouldn't assume it would. Thank you. I appreciate chatting yeah. with you. I'd love to chat with you more sometime. Sure. Thanks, Donnie. Appreciate the time. Okay, Dr. Dan, thank you so much for joining. Paul and Dan, I appreciate the back and forth. Very interesting uh, back and forth discussions the entire night. It's been a great uh, open mic discussion. Paul, I appreciate your time. Um, I do have, it's, it's up to you, Paul. I have a non-skeptic in the backstage who said he has one quick question. Not sure if you have time to. Yeah, let, let's just, let's let this be the last one because I got to, I got to cut it off, but let's do one quick question. Okay, Brian. So you basically kicked off the open mic. And so thank you. And now we're going to end the open mic uh, with you, Brian. So we'll uh, give you the opportunity to ask uh, Paul a, a question. And then I think we're going to start winding things down as two hours really has flown by. So go ahead. Right. Uh, I appreciate your answer so far, uh, uh, Paul. They've been really great. Um, I was curious about uh, uh, most young earth Christianists use what is called a uh, reductio ad absurdum argument where it, it and I think you kind of hinted at this where it's kind of like you're saying, OK, the evolution, the evolutionist wants to use these arguments. Well, from their perspective, we could show how most of them would even support their viewpoint even from that perspective, would you be okay with someone using these kinds of reducto? Not definitively. As I understood young earth creationists, they don't say that necessarily that this, like you said, proves in an absolute sense, that sort of thing. But because uh, only an eyewitness uh, historical account can actually prove definitively what happened in the past. But in the case of... Um, um, in the case of uh, of trying to show the inconsistency of that, because uh, a reductio ad absurdum basically shows that the conclusion is inconsistent with itself if we assume the same things. So if I assume their position, I can so show from that perspective at least yeah. most of the evidence doesn't seem to agree with that. No, so I, would I you agree, agree with, with the yeah. use of the reductio ad absurdum? Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. And. Um... Absolutely. I do support the use of reductio ad absurdum arguments. They are they are a good thing to use if you're using it correctly. And in fact, you know, some of the evidences I presented tonight would maybe fall into that category, um, you know, but but yeah, it's 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 a very important thing. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It's it's a good general question you brought up, but I, I do I do think it's something that people need to be aware of. That you know, if you if you take the presuppositions that your opponent is is working under, uh, and then you follow them out to their logical conclusion, a lot of times you can find that that it doesn't make a lot of sense. So, I, I do uh, I do definitely um, agree with you on that. That's a good point to bring out, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank awesome. you very much. And for Dr. Dan, I'm, I'm going to mention Dr. Dan uh, is still active with us here in the chat. He's saying eyewitness accounts are famously unreliable. That is the statement that uh, atheists continually like to, to, to trot out. Uh, and I know Mark Reed has said the same thing over and over. Uh, police know that that eyewitness uh, accounts are famously unreliable. Well, the police are the eyewitnesses. So are you saying that's unreliable? It's it's a self-defeating claim. Uh, Dr. Dan, I hope you understand that this is yeah. entirely self-defeating. Uh, uh, operational science. It's depends actually a upon, fallacy of logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Operational science depends upon eyewitness testimony. And so does every other aspect of human life and civilization. So 
if eyewitness testimony is unreliable, we all can just go home. We're all eyewitnesses. So let's all just, you know, let's just stop talking about anything. If eyewitnesses can't be trusted, neither can any scientific paper, neither can any historical document, neither can anything, because we're all human beings. And everything we say is based on either somebody else's eyewitness or our eyewitness. So if we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, let's just all go home. But that's uh, that's all I have to say on that one. It's kind of okay. It's kind of like what Richard Bachman said and uh, Jesus and the eyewitnesses. Um, uh, all knowledge, uh, all knowledge, or all testimony, like uh, most, uh, like all knowledge is based on uh, test, uh, based on. Uh, eyewitness report basically what someone else tells you even a lot of scientific stuff that, that we take for granted we're listening other people say that they observe that and then we're and then we're yeah. reporting it yeah um the scientific method is entirely dependent on eyewitnesses it's dependent upon uh, a scientist going out collecting data well that's a witness when you write down data you are writing a witness to something you are being an eyewitness when you observe something you are being an eyewitness. Let's. It's it's simple, but but it doesn't go without saying these days. All right. Well, with that, Brian, I appreciate it, Paul. We may have to do this again in the future, as it has been a great turnout. I've still got uh, one more skeptic in the backstage, Mark Reed. Mark and uh, Paul have had a formal debate. Unfortunately, we have hit the two hour mark and I do really wanna respect your time, Paul, as you've given to us two hours of your time. Let, and let's, so- Let's give Mark like, you know, two minutes. If, if, he can, if he can be super brief, then we'll be super brief. But other than that, I, I gotta go. Okay, well, it looks like we've got some bonus footage after credit okay. scene here with uh with mark reed so mark thank you super for joining brief, super brief super okay, brief ahead, okay so, so there's multiple scientific methods they all follow the same general pattern yes when we're studying history they might vary but it's the same methodology that we're applying that falls into the observation testing sort of sort of the paradigm um the the i, I came in late so the only thing i really heard is that that eyewitness data is unreliable and we're not relying on eyewitness data when we do scientific testing because that that testing is given to other people to replicate. They don't say, hey, because this scientist said it, it's got to be true. They replicate that. How, how do they know if they've replicated it? Well, they follow the same methodology that the person. Yeah, but down. how, so how will someone... they know? How will they know if their results are the same as what the other person got? Yes, I'm, I'm getting to that. So um, they replicate the methodology that the person uses and then put down what their results are as well. That's the replication of it. And then we communicate with each other what we found. If you're sort of questioning that's your eyewitness senses, testimony, when you communicate well, what you found, no. that's eyewitness testimony. That's what it means. I, I think you're I think you're um, sort of mistaking um, communication as in to say what sort of empirical instrumentation recorded and what you empirically find with just relying on somebody saying hey this is what my senses observed like we test these things through multiple senses in multiple different ways over many different people and then that that becomes a lot more reliable than just I one mean, person I mean I I totally that. agree with you that having more yeah. eyewitnesses to the event to the event i agree with that i'm not i'm not arguing with that but you seem to you seem to be getting confused about the meaning of the the basic term eyewitness and testimony so when you witness something uh -huh. that's observation and then if you communicate that to somebody in some way whether it be writing it down or calling them on the phone that's your testimony so when you're looking when you're trying to repeat a scientific experiment and you're writing down your results and then you're looking at what this other person got, the only way you can know that they got that result is if you're trusting their eyewitness testimony. And so on well, and so on it goes. Then other people have to trust your testimony to see if their results agree with your results. But it that's all not depends the same upon as, testimony. That's not the same as sort of saying, well, I saw this, not getting any methodology for it, just I saw it. Because your senses can be wrong. You can see a mirage and think, hey, that's water. And it's not. 
light can refract. We know this. It can produce all kinds of weird optical illusions. So your senses aren't entirely fallible. But what they're doing is corroborating it with instrumentation and other um, methods so it's not reliant on that one sense. Like if you see a mirage or just say you see an optical illusion, you can go up and touch it. You can verify that that is or is not the case. And that's yeah. what they're doing. Their methodology is to not give an eyewitness because that's just one sense. That's just I saw this. They're corroborating yeah. it along multiple people with multiple different things, including instrumentation, which instrumentation cannot be an eyewitness account. It can't be. I'm sorry, it just can't be. Well, when you when you read the results of your instrument, that's mm -hmm. where it becomes an eyewitness. But I think that a particular historical individual that you would have probably gotten along well with uh, is the famous man uh, Doubting Thomas, the Apostle Thomas. Uh, mm -hmm. He agreed with you that he wasn't going to trust just one sense. He was never going to yes. believe that Jesus rose from the dead unless he saw it and he needed a second sense. He needed to place his hand in the wounds mm -hmm. of Christ. And so well, he had uh, his eyes closed. He had his eyes closed. Didn't didn't he demand to feel it? And they said, close your eyes and feel the wound. No, he didn't. No, he didn't have to close okay. his eyes. No. But see, I, I think you're misremembering he, that. I don't I don't recall there being any closing of eyes, but okay. he, he did put out his hand and touch the wounds of mm -hmm. Christ. And only because uh, he could do that was he willing to believe and Jesus sort of rebuked him a bit. He said, uh, you know, you believe because you see. Uh, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And um, yet, nonetheless, Jesus did condescend to allow him to touch anyway. He did let him do it so that he would believe. And then this guy, Thomas, went to his death for that testimony after putting his hand in the wounds. Well, that's... That's if that testimony is to be believed. At the end of the day, it's just testimony. That's all it is. It's a, it's a story. That's all. Like that's we can't all anything ask, is, Mark. We that's can't ask Thomas is. about his his methodology and what he found. Um, Thomas never wrote anything. In fact, I think there was a Gospel of Thomas, if I'm not mistaken, that didn't actually make it into the Bible. Uh, well, it because, wasn't written by Thomas. It was pseudepigraphal. Well, we don't know who wrote most of the Gospels, to be fair. We don't know for sure that that um, Luke was written by Luke and Mark was written by Mark and that, that who wrote We them. actually know but the in, one that was in the same the gospel, way that we would know who Thomas wrote anything was not actually admitted into the Bible because of the stories in it were so sort of far fetched and unbelievable. So we don't have Thomas's account. In fact, we don't have any of, of Mark, Luke, John's uh, account. Um, because they, they're historically deemed to be written by these people, but you don't know for sure. Um, so not only do you have the problem that you're relying on eyewitness testimony and no other things but eyewitness testimony, but also you don't know who the actual eyewitnesses in fact were. Well, there, there's not a single shred of historical evidence that the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by anyone other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's not even the tiniest shred of evidence that they were written by anyone else. There was never any debate in the church about who wrote it. There was never a council called. Nobody ever had to say, okay, we're getting too many possible authors here. Uh, we got to call a council on this, and we're going to make a decree. Luke wrote Luke. Matthew wrote Matthew. John wrote John. That never happened. And uh, there's a reason why that never happened, because there was never any debate about it. And there's never been a shred of evidence anyone has ever been able to produce that any other author was the author of these books, except the people that are attached the names to them. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. that simple. So, 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 yes, historically, the church has always attributed these people to writing them. And that's well, never why would that be, Mark, the if they didn't but write at the them. front of the books? If I could just finish at the front of the books, it does acknowledge that it's historically attributed to these people. That's what the, the front of the books say. Um, that being said, you know, a lot of scholars say that we cannot definitively tie them to these people, that that's just what the church has always said. Sure, but that's not a reason for saying that we know for a fact that they wrote them. 
you're sort of going prove they didn't write them which is a sort of nonsensical sort of position to be in it's it's sort of saying well we'll prove that caesar didn't write this novel that i have on my shelf like prove it well it, no it's, it's because nonsensical you can't prove anything in the past you can't prove they did write them you can't prove they didn't write them we're right. talking about what what evidence we have and so if right. somebody wants to make a claim that the Gospels are anonymous, they need to support that claim with some kind of they evidence. And nobody has ever supported that claim with any evidence. They Just saying that scholars say something isn't evidence. That's an argument. No, no, they, 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 they are anonymous. The names, the, 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 the writings do not have the names attributed to them. That is literally what anonymous means. It means they are unnamed, which means that the texts themselves do not have the names like this is. You know, have you ever uh, opened Luke a Bible writing. and and not seen the name of the author at the beginning of the book? Uh, yeah, I've also seen the part where it says that traditionally they're associated with these people, but there has never know, been a manuscript ever discovered of any of the Gospels that did not have the author's name on it. So in the writings, the, I, I realized that that they put on them. Hey, this is the Gospel of Luke. And this is the gospel of Mark, and this is the gospel, but nowhere in those two That's does, not does anonymous, it say, then, Mark. this <laughs> is no, <laughs> because the, the church name, gave them those anonymous. names. The church gave them those names. They didn't read it and say, Hey, here's where it says this is Luke writing. That's not what it says. And it doesn't when we found the manuscripts, did they have those names on the front cover kind of thing? Yes. By Luke. Yes. They did not. Every no, single they did manuscript. Not. Every manuscript that has ever been discovered of the Gospels has all had the uh, the author's name on it. Every no, single they one. Don't. No anonymous no, they manuscripts haven't. have ever been discovered. No, you're wrong. They do not have an authorship written on the manuscripts that we find. They do not. They're just the manuscripts, and they have the story as it appears in the book. But they in have there. the name no... of the author at the beginning. No, no, no. The church says that is who is likely to have written it, and they have kept that tradition all the time. No, the That's church never why said... they print in the Bible that we do not, historically, these names are associated with them, but we have, you know, do not say with certainty that it is them. Any reputable scholar will say this. Anyone Mark, at all. I have to even correct Christian you. scholars. I have to correct you. The church never said this is who likely wrote Mark. Mark. The church has never sure. said that. It's this is the author. The church never expressed any doubt whatsoever about this. It's not oh, as yeah, if I'm aware of that. Okay, so I guess my question to you is why why has the church always been unanimously in agreement? Because you know as well as I do, mm -hmm. it's very hard to get Christians unanimous on anything. We argue about everything we can find in the Bible. I mean, sure. if you you're aware of that because you're aware of Donnie's channel, we Christians argue about the Trinity. We argue about um, Calvinism. We argue about I mean, name it and we argue about it. But you're asking me to believe that somehow magically nobody has ever in all the history of the church argued about the authorship of the Gospels. I find okay, that so very let, curious. Let's go through it. Mark, um, it was according to tradition, early church fathers. It was a first tested to by Papias of Hierapolis that the author is Mark the Evangel Evangelist, and the companion of the Apostle Peter. That's that's what they've said, right? That's that, that's their position. Yeah. Um, early church tradition first attested by Papias of Hierapolis again. Church, the, the Gospel of Matthew written in Hebrew by the Ap Apostle Matthew, the tax collector and Jesus, but according to the majority of modern scholars, unlikely this this gospel was written by an eyewitness. Modern scholars interpret the tradition to mean that Papias writing about 125 to 150 CE, so that's you know nearly a century after the events or over a century after the events, believes that Matthew had made a collections of the saying of Jesus. So yeah, there's a modern lot of scholars disagreement. express modern scholars express doubt over yes. the authorship. Nobody at yes. the time did. What so you think we've gone backwards in knowledge that we've, we've, we've oh yes oh knowledge? yes <laughs> oh yes yeah what watch okay. my well, presentation I mean, uh, watch my presentation yeah, evidence I, I, is I lost that... over time yes so historical yeah, the, the evidence is Luke... lost over time the the further we get away from an event the less evidence we have about that event the more evidence is lost over time oh, so yes we are that is going not backwards. true. 
I'm sorry, that is not true. Like, for instance, the um, uh, Richard III, when when Shakespeare wrote the the play that he was an evil monster and a hunchback and deformed, we then, his modern historians, found that he wasn't deformed. They found paintings of him, he's perfectly fine. And in fact, the reason why Richard III was said to have killed the twins in the in the tower was probably because Henry Tudor, who was around at the time, probably killed the kids and wanted to pin it on the current bad guy around. So he was vilified in recent memory. There is no suggestion that that, that history gets accurate the more closer we get to it. That is not not really something that you can... You, you, you don't can think that a historian who has access to documents that have since been lost, but you don't think that didn't. historian would be more likely to be correct than a modern historian who doesn't have access to those lost documents. I, that, that isn't didn't. very believable to me. But unfortunately, but like I've didn't. said, I do have to cut it off. What I would like you to do, I'm okay. very glad. Okay. I'm very glad that you did uh, show up to have this talk but I hope you will go back and actually listen to my presentation from the beginning because sure, sure, it, it yeah, I definitely important. will, Paul. Thank you. And we um, can yeah, and about, I think we can talk maybe about we should have a have a, a a a debate on the philosophy of science because um, the the whole idea that that scientific methodology is is somehow comparable to eyewitness is just baffling to me. That's that's so baffling. I don't no, no, understand. There are two different things: eyewitness testimony, and then well. Just watch the presentation. I, I I don't think I can do a better job than what I what I already did. But but yes, okay. a, absolutely. Uh, I appreciate the appreciate right, well, the time. Well, thank you so spent. much for your time. I I really appreciate it. I know that you went over to accommodate me, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Donnie, and thank you, Paul. I it's you know, we're going to disagree, pleasure. but interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's always a pleasure talking with you, Mark. You have a good one. You too. Thank Mark, you. Thank you so much for joining. Joining always thank a you. privilege. Mark always makes for an excellent uh, back and forth discussion. So, yes. Paul, you have definitely earned your open mic golden badge tonight. You engaged all the critics. We started with Andrew. We had Beamsy, Jackson Road, Dr. Dan, and the final boss, as many in the live <laughs> chat have been saying, Mark Reed. Okay. So, you, Paul, you're an excellent uh, apologist. Brother, you're a blessing to the faith. And also, I appreciate how calm, collected, and professional you remain. You really are a fantastic debater. You know what you're doing. You're well-rounded. And Thanks, you got a lot of knowledge. So I appreciate your time. You have gone over. and But I think this was a great open mic discussion. It was fast-paced. We got a lot of uh, great guests on the panel for tonight. And it really is always a, a pleasure. Uh, to have you here, Paul. So let me hand it to you in case you had any final words, final thoughts. And again, great job tonight. Uh, just thank you, everybody, for listening. If you if you did come in late, please, please go back and check out the presentation because it is a, such an important topic. And I think the fact that we got so many uh, scientists coming in, uh, trying to take issue with it and and trying to, to butt heads with me about this shows you, you know, the old saying, you're you're if you're not taking flack, you're probably not over the target, right? So go back and watch this presentation. Thank you. Amen. Well said. Great final words. The presentation was a must watch. We do these live. So if you're just joining us or have joined us in the last hour, please go back, make sure to watch the uh, roughly 40 minute presentation. It is an important presentation. I think all skeptics and non-skeptics need to need, need to watch it. And I also appreciate Paul being willing to engage uh, the skeptics and answer questions from from non-skeptics, I think it's important that we uh, engage the critics on these topics. So with that, Paul, again, thank you so much. Uh, your relevant links to your articles, excellent articles uh, on all sorts of topics are linked in the um, description box. I do have a playlist now on the channel titled uh, Paul Price on Standing for Truth, something like that. People can find all of your past appearances here with us. That includes your formal debates, your informal debates, and also uh, just discussions you and I have had, one spe uh, specifically on Behemoth, which I think was great. Yeah. So with yeah, so with that, Paul, again, I appreciate over two hours of your time. To the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. And Standing for Truth is out. God bless all.